It is good to be back. I returned from Germany and Israel, Palestine, and Jordan uh, to test positive to COVID the very next day. Um, so the month of June is a blur. It's gone. It's good to be back together again. And I want to thank my colleagues, Reverend Emily Corzine and Reverend Joanna Samuelson for doing such a magnificent job uh, through the month of June and covering not once but two weeks in my COVID time. Um, I continue to test positive, and uh, so I'll stay away from you, but I, I've been told that this could go on for 90 more days. COVID has its way, doesn't it? Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In the book of Exodus, chapter 7, verse 26, the struggle for freedom is distilled in the conflict between Moses and Pharaoh, in which God gradually raises the suffering of the slave-holding, slave-driving Egyptians as a result of Pharaoh's stubborn refusal to let Israel go. The Eternal One says to Moses, you go to Pharaoh and you say to him, thus says the Eternal One, let my people go that they may serve me. God declares that God's people should be free, free to worship God. They should be free, free to choose between good and evil. They should be free to choose between generosity and selfishness free to be fully who they were created to be, not slaves, not less than human in any way, not beholden to any tyrant, not tied to any way which chains the body or the mind. God's plan is always for freedom. God calls us to be free. Four weeks ago today, I was in Dachau concentration camp in the town of Dachau, Germany. Dachau was Hitler's first concentration camp and served as the prototype for more than 44,000 camps and other incarceration sites, including ghettos, that Hitler set up from 1933 to 1945. As I walked this sacred earth, I felt as though I was walking through the heart of darkness, the absolute antithesis of a freedom land. The camp opened March 22, 1933. Moving silently through the history of Dachau, one of the very first signs I read named the first people brought into the camp. It was stunning, particularly if you go back a month and consider what was on this sign. The sign read, homosexuals and those women who had abortions. LGBTQIA Germans, and women who made choices not to carry their pregnancies forward, and the doctors who provided medical support to women in their choices were the first ones imprisoned, flogged, tortured, tormented, and murdered in Dachau. Add to this Jehovah's Witnesses, emigrants, communists, comedians, socialists, trade unionists, and yes, Hitler's number one target the Jews, who came in the tens of thousands after 1938. As the prototype camp, Heinrich Himmler, head of the German SS, saw to it that all other camps and detention sites were run like Dachau, and he brought everyone who ran them to be trained at Dachau. As I stood there, absorbing this horrifying truth, about fascism and ultimately about freedom, my mind drifted to Pastor Martin Niemöller, who many of you know this quote, but who started as a pastor who supported Adolf Hitler and then turned against him as the truth of Hitler's narcissistic, sociopathic reign of terror continued. Niemöller said, first, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. 
Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. I did not speak out. Those words are haunting, especially when you stand in a place which is formed by the heart of darkness in the world's darkest hours. Today, we stand at a crossroad in our nation's history. Here at the crossroad, we need to speak out. At this crossroad, we have a few significant patriots who have been standing up and speaking with truth to power. Three of my favorites are lifelong Republicans. Representative Liz Cheney, Representative Adam Kinzinger, Kinzinger and now 25-year-old Cassidy Hutchinson, an aide to former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. They have pitched their tents on the side of truth-telling and justice and freedom. They are speaking out even as they are salted and lied about by the former president and members of their own beloved party. So thanks be to God for patriots like Liz and Adam and Cassidy. But wait, there's more on this Freedom Sunday. We are also witnesses at this crossroad to a new supermajority of the Supreme Court with a dangerous vision of history and tradition. In just the last week, the Supreme Court has attacked at least four standards that have stood for nearly half a century. It has taken a hammer to the wall of separation between church and state, allowed the southern state of Louisiana to weaken the voting power of African Americans and called into question the right to privacy that secured a, a right to legal abortion, as well as naming in that decision the same-sex marriage, access to contraception, and potentially even interracial marriage. And the last decision has declared that the Environmental Protection Agency can't be the Environmental Protection Agency, a precedent that is frightening in relation to our ability to fight global warming and also has stunning and disastrous consequences for all other agencies and government operations meant to serve the freedoms and greater good of our most vulnerable citizens and communities. In all these cases, the Supremes toss these decision-making powers to Congress and to the state governments, which is as disingenuous and idiotic as an idea that, that has ever come out of the pillared halls of the court since the Dred Scott decision of 1857, which, by the way, helped fuel the American Civil War. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine our Congress which until just 10 days ago had failed for 30 years to pass any legislation about guns, ever coming to the place where they can formulate and enact any policies which care for the earth under our feet or the water and our skies in America, not to mention those who are poor and forgotten, who live upon this earth we call our homeland. As troubling as these decisions are, there is an even more dangerous common thread connecting them. This court is systematically erecting a new judicial standard based on the invocation of history and tradition that is rooted in a vision of a mythical 1950s white Christian America. So, is this what freedom looks like in 2022? I certainly hope not. On this 4th of July weekend, I pray to the Eternal One that we are freed from such freedoms as this. Rather, let us follow the way of God to the pathways of freedom, believing that the liberties and freedoms we cherish for ourselves must be extended to all. Not one of us can be free all by our lonesome selves. Each one of us ties our lives to the greater life of the life of humanity the life of all who are created to be free. On this 4th of July weekend, Paul's letter to the Galatians, which is nicknamed the Gospel of Christian Freedom, challenges us with an image of power and glory that undercuts all sorts of pride. 
Paul's voice booms humbly through the scriptures saying, may I never boast of anything but the cross. According to Paul, no attempt at virtue can make us worthy of God's love and grace. God's love and grace are ours, free and unmerited. In Christ, we encounter God with skin on, who identifies humbly with us, even while we seek a God who conforms, even while we seek a God who conforms to our ideals of power and might. You see, Jesus spent his life in mission to give life witness to God's vulnerability and non-compulsory interaction with humanity. When Jesus commissioned the 70 disciples in Luke 10, creating an image for disciples going forth, he sent them out, as he said, as lambs among wolves. He sent his disciples out to serve others. He equipped them with nothing more than the gospel message of the reign of God. That's it. Just bring the love and the reign of God and the kingdom of God to people. That's all you go with. They were to demonstrate God's reign of love in the future so powerfully that it would last all this time for us to gra grab hold of now. In order for the disciples to understand the message they were preaching, Jesus insisted that their gift to others would be couched in poverty. As unshod missionaries without money or provisions they needed, bed and board, at the same time they were seeking new hearts and new homes for Christ's message of love. In Jesus' methodology, the 70 missionaries could not preach their message of mutual love and vulnerability unless they were living and learning the same way from moment to moment. What are we to take from these readings on this Freedom Holiday Weekend? First, we need to pay attention to how countercultural our gospel is. We may live in the most powerful nation on earth, but the might of our country has very little to do with the vulnerable, non-coercive character of God's divine power. Second, Jesus sent his disciples out without snack packs, without credit cards, without reservations to an Airbnb, without any hotel set aside. He just sent them out. In our version of that type of vulnerability, we are called to give humble witness to the gospel of peacemaking, as Joanna talked about, the gospel of freedom seeking and justice for all who are marginalized in a society filled with too much violence and individualism and private privilege. Being chosen begins to sound more dangerous than special when you're fighting for freedom and justice for all, but that's what we're called to do. Like our ancestors, each one of us is called in spite of our flaws. We must learn from the 70, the tough lessons of freedom in our fight for what is right, what is just, what is true. To paraphrase Jesus, sometimes we will knock Satan down and sometimes Satan will knock us down. But if we remember who we are and who has chosen us, we won't need to worry about any of the wolves. As we step out of the church today and into the remainder of our 246th birthday celebration, I leave you with this quote from Abraham Lincoln. Delivered two years before he became president, probably nobody even knew who he was when he said it, but he spoke it in Edwardsville, Illinois on September 13, 1858. Listen to these words about liberty and freedom. What constitutes the bulwark of our own liberty, what constitutes the bulwark of our own liberty and independence, he starts. It is not our frowning battlements, our bristling seacoasts, our army and our navy. These are not our reliance against tyranny. All of these may be turned against us without making us weaker for the struggle. Our reliance is the love of liberty which God has planted in each one of us. Our defense is the spirit which prizes liberty at the heritage of all people in all lands everywhere. Destroy this spirit and you have planted the seeds of despotism on your own doorstep. Familiarize yourselves with the chains of bondage and you prepare your own limbs to wear them. Accustomed to trample on the rights of others, you have lost the genius of your independence and become the fit subject 
of the first cunning tyrant who rises among you if you do not know who you are. May freedom burn in our hearts. And may we speak and act out for what is right, for what is true, for what is just, now and always, with the cross guiding us. And in the shadow of the cross, may we feel and know the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. And as you go forth today, remember, it's in him that we know what true freedom looks like.